This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 25th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, what Governor Dunleavy's address last week to the Alaska Municipal League says to us about next year's budget. Second, our thoughts on legislative finance head David Teal's legacy as he retires. And third, why Conoco's proposal to sell 25% of its interest in its west side properties bothers us. And now, let's join Michael. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the weekly top three. First and foremost, the governor's quandary. The governor has got a bit of a challenge here. He has uh, he has stated that uh, he is not going to be uh, he's not going to be tackling the uh, you know oil uh, taxes for municipalities, nor is he going to uh, be transferring any of the fish tax wealth or anything out of anywhere. That makes it uh, makes it a little more difficult. Number one, transfer from tax revenues. Yeah, the governor spoke at uh, AML, the Alaska Municipal League, uh, this past week, and and uh spoke via uh video he didn't he didn't appear personally but had a had a video appearance and one of the things he said uh, in that video appearance uh was was curious to me um and and really is is limiting his options uh on on the budget the governor's gradually sort of revealing different pieces of the budget sort of by negative implication, I guess, as he goes along, as we get nearer uh, the December uh, date that the budget's due. Um, and this was sort of one of those. Previously, uh, the governor had said, uh, when, the court, when, when the court decision came out that said that the legislature, the Superior Court decision, that the legislature could uh, forward fund uh, education, the governor, in his response, said something that many interpreted, including me, uh, as as saying that he wouldn't be reducing K through 12 uh, funding this coming year. At AML uh, this past week, uh, he said what many, including me, interpreted as saying that he won't be uh, uh, proposing again, as he did last year, to uh, move uh, a significant amount of what are now local taxes, local property taxes. Uh, from the local level up to the state level. Last year, he had proposed uh, revisions to the property tax statutes that would have the effect of moving uh, the property the, the property tax that local governments are allowed to assess on uh, oil and gas properties, moving those from the local level up to the state level. Uh, and that would affect largely uh, the... Uh, uh, Arctic North, North Slope Borough, the Fairbanks North Star Borough, the uh, Valdez, uh, the city of Valdez, municipality of Valdez, and the Kenai Borough, all of which get some property taxes from uh, from uh, assessments on oil and gas properties. And in, in the aggregate, most of this coming from the North Slope Borough, uh, in the aggregate, uh, that was about $400 million of, of his budget last year in revenues that were being moved from the local level uh, up to the state level. A big chunk uh, of what his budget uh, proposed to try to get the budget back in balance. What he told Mel, uh, interpreted me, uh, he's not going to make a proposal again this year, um, that he's not going to propose to move those revenues from the local level up to the, up to the state level. 
Uh, he got a lot of political blowback on that last year, so it's sort of understandable from a political standpoint why he's not going down that road again. But as he as he says these things, as he says, for example, on K twelve K through twelve that he's not going to go after K through twelve uh, funding, as he says at AML that he's not going to seek to uh, upstream those revenues, those local uh, revenues up to the up to the state level, um, as as he agreed last year to uh, fix the the reductions he was seeking um, at, from the university at, at half the level he initially proposed in his budget and then spread even that, uh, the reduced amount over three years. As he says those things, he's, he's narrowing in his options on what, what he does about this budget um, uh, this year. He hasn't revealed the budget, um, and so we don't really know how all these things stack up. But but the 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 net result of of these various comments is that he's narrowing down what he's what he's saying he's going to cut, uh, and he's narrowing down now with the comments at AML what he's saying he's going to do uh, with respect to you know non tax revenues or non uh, non new tax revenues, um, and he's and he's leaving himself he's narrowing down his options in a way that sort of is going to make this budget even more difficult than it otherwise was. When you look at the projections, we're already probably at a billion three uh, in terms of deficit uh, between traditional revenues and um, and uh, 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 spending uh, levels, uh, even, at, even at the reduced levels we had last year, from last year. Um, and even after you take into account uh, Hammond 50, even if you, after you take into account uh, the, the portion of the uh, permanent fund draw that uh, this stays with the state can stay with the state for um, uh, spending purposes, excluding the the portion that goes to the statutory PFD. We're still at a billion plus uh, deficit. So if you if you're not going to upstream revenues, uh, which was 400 million last year, you're not going to do that. You're not going to cut K through 12. You've already you've already taken the university cuts off the table. You only you're you're only going to get 25 million. Uh, additional out of university cuts uh, this coming year. Um, you're, you're really uh, narrowing down uh, what what you've got left to play with, and that's um, it, it's it's it, it's sort of that sort of cycles back and makes what happened last week uh, with Bruce Tangeman's announcement of his resignation uh, sort of that adds to the mix and makes you think that. Uh, that the governor is in fact going to propose some form of revenues right. uh, as a way of, of filling the budget. And, and of course, that I kind of touched base with that on the governor last week, and I didn't really get any response from that. I didn't, you know, he basically said that he was looking for somebody who would be willing to talk about all the various uh, all the various options that are there on the table, um, including, I think that the implication there was including the budget. And so, yeah, it's a little discouraging and it's a little disheartening, but again, not surprising based on the governor, the reaction to the governor's budget. I mean, everything from the, the you know, the kind of the hate filled screeds to the recall effort all seem to be centered around this uh, this problem. Yeah, the, the 400 million last year when he proposed that, that's what, you know, Valdez, many will recall that Valdez sort of went off the rails, the Valdez city government, uh, the mayor. Uh, I believe it was sort of called immediately for the governor's uh, recall as a result of that, um, and and that was that was a, there was a huge reaction from Valdez. There was a huge reaction from uh, the North Slope Borough, which would be uh, adversely impacted. A portion of their revenues would be would be taken away uh, as a result of that, and ASRC. Uh, the native corporation on the North Slope, uh, which had supported the governor in the election, had an adverse reaction as well. And then there was a reaction from Western Alaska. Part of the part of the proposal was to take uh, what were local fish taxes uh, and and bring them upstream them to the state uh, as well. Not as significant by any stretch of the imagination as the as the oil taxes, but to do that, and there was a reaction from Western Alaska as a result of that. So yeah, so so you can you can see why. Uh, the governor's reaction is is not to go down that road again. He, he didn't even get a hearing. The bills to to change the local the oil and gas uh, property taxes didn't even get a hearing in either legislative body. It was sort of dead on arrival. Um, so you can sort of see politically, bad reaction, no response, uh, no positive response whatsoever 
uh, in the legislature to to those steps, uh, and you can see why the governor's doing it. But but as 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 these things piece together, as the statement on K through 12, um, uh, and, and now and as the as the deal on the university uh, during the session, uh, and now uh, as as he makes his statement to AML. Um, you, you're just you're, you're you're you get the sense that we're just narrowing down the options. I mean, you still got Medicaid, uh, right? And that's that's a that's a potential. You've still got uh, things like debt reimbursement. Uh, that was a one year deal that uh, that the legislature did last year on on debt reimbursement for local school bonds. Uh, they have to they didn't change the statute. They just decided not to fund it last year, and that's a that's a year to year deal. So you've still got debt reimbursement, but, but all of that uh, together really doesn't have uh, the huge impact that, that you're going to need to close a billion plus uh, dollar deficit. Well, and I think that's the, that's the biggest issue. And of course, Alaskans now are going to be looking at, you know, these, you know, alternatives, different revenues, different uh, taxation things. I mean, I think that's kind of the direction that they're going to have to, they're going to, they're going to try and take this which has been one of the reasons why we've talked about trying to craft that narrative if it does come to that, and I think it is. I think although many Alaskans would rather have cuts, uh, I, I think the cutting crowd at this point is on the is on the is is at the at the down low. They're on the they're on the bottom end of the spectrum. All this backpedaling from the budget reform. Yep, Governor Ben Stevens is firmly in charge. What what do you say to that, Brad? I mean, we've kind of been watching this. We saw the departure of Babcock. I was a little hesitant with uh, with Ben Stevens coming in. Uh, and there's been, of course, a lot of commentary now that this is just back to more of the business as usual uh, mentality uh, with Ben Stevens kind of firmly got his hand on the tiller of the, kind of the administration. I mean, I'm not saying that, that Dunleavy, you know, is not in charge per se, but it's tough when your first mate is kind of running the running the ship behind, you know, behind you doing all these different things. Well, but let's look at what happened last legislature, right? I mean, the governor proposed... Uh, significant, huge cuts uh, in various programs, and he proposed upstream about, you know, the four hundred million dollars from from local government in order to balance the budget. So let's look at what happened during the legislature. He he couldn't get a hearing, not one hearing, on the and this was with this is with Republicans in charge of the Senate, at least in charge of the Senate. Uh, he couldn't get one hearing in either body on the proposal to upstream the revenues from local government. And when push came to shove, at during the course of the uh, during the course of the legislature, he ultimately couldn't get 16 legislators to stay with him on the level of budget cuts that he that he wanted initially, uh, or that he or that he proposed after the first round of vetoes. I mean, I mean, he couldn't hold 16 uh, to to support the first even to support the first round of vetoes. So he had we came back, and then we had the 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 second. Uh, uh, session, the legislature passed a, a budget again with higher spending than the first round of vetoes, and we ultimately ended up with the second round of vetoes, and that's sort of where the budget process ended. But he couldn't hold 16 in the legislature for the for the level of cuts he got. So, um, it, it, yes, uh, there there have been changes in in. I mean, Don is gone, uh, 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 Tuckerman's gone, uh, and we have what would what what some describe as a more moderate uh, staff uh, in place now, but, but it's not, I mean, it's, it's chicken and egg. I mean, would that staff have been there? Had the governor, would that new staff have been there? Had the governor been successful in, in, in moving forward on the $400 million in, in revenue he wanted to take, he wanted to move up from local government and on the, and on support for the level of cuts he got, if he had had support for that, uh, I'm not sure we would have a new staff in place, but he right. didn't get that level of support. Right. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, I guess when you realize that you're not, you know, the 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 team you've got right now is not rowing you to victory. I guess sometimes you need to get a new team. But uh, you know, again, I, I'm just concerned. You know, you got Donna Arduin, you got Bruce Tangerman. Now you've got, you know, you had Tuckerman Babcock leave, and now we've got a whole kind of a whole new crew in there and really no idea of where things are going. And all we can do is what you've been doing, which is extrapolate out based on his comments at like AML and other things, uh, you know, comments from, from Tangerman when he left and uh, just kind of this, the reaction of the people. And I mean, I think it all basically spells what we've been talking about, which is 
uh, there is going to be a discussion about new revenues. Now, whether that's a tapping deeper into the permanent fund, fundamentally changing the formula to the 75-25 that they're pitching right now, or maybe some form of new taxation because there's just not enough horsepower right now to get uh, any kind of fur- f- uh, further cuts onto the table. Yeah, and, and, and we need to keep in mind during this discussion, we already have taxes, right? PFD cuts are right, taxes. Right, right. Uh, and and they're just they're just a form of taxes that hit the middle and lower income Alaska families hardest. Uh, but we already have taxes, so so the question really is going forward. We're, we're he's gr- gradually rolling cuts off the table. I mean that's what the comment about K through 12 is, um, and that's what the deal with the university was. Cuts are actually are, are sort of rolling off the table. Now with this statement to AM, AML, his efforts to, to upstream revenues from local governments is sort of is so, sort of rolling off the table. That's that's leaving. I mean, we, we already have taxes. We already have PFD cuts. Um, and that's sort of exposing them out there that we're going to need some form of new revenue. The debate's really not going to be, do we have do we have new revenue or not? The debate's going to be, what form of new revenue um, do we have? Um, and that's that's really what we ought to talk about it as not 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 should we do something new that we haven't done before. It's we're already there in terms of new revenue. What's the best way to approach that new revenue? And you just said something that I think is pretty, you know, it, 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 it profound. I guess is 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 the word that I'm looking for. And I think it I think it needs to be said. I think people need to hear it. And we were talking about you know this. Uh, uh, you know what the governor had said at AML from number one of the top three that you know that some of these things were off the table and that there was going to be a fundamental change in the way the budgeting is done. And I said, you know, that there's probably going to be a lot more discussion on new revenues, and they may talk about taxation. Uh, they may talk about take, taking the permanent fund even deeper. They may talk about all these other things. And you made, I think, a very valid point to say, look, it's we're already being taxed. It's not a question of generating new revenues. It's which revenues are we going to take next? I mean, can you synopsize that for us again? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, as you as you retreat from making cuts, as you retreat from um, from you know upstreaming revenues from local government, which the governor proposed last time, you're 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 creating the budget. I mean, you're recreating the budget gap. It's not that we haven't had this budget gap the last four years. We have, and it's been been filled with taxes. Uh, PFD cuts are taxes. They're 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 reductions uh, in the in the, they're the conversion to government diversion to government of revenue that otherwise goes to individuals. That's sort of the same as, as withholding, uh, federal withholding uh, uh, taxes uh, on, on, on income subject to federal income tax. It's a, it's a state form of withholding uh, 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 taxes on, on, on Alaskans, all Alaskans and only Alaskans. Uh, and we've had that the last four years. We had it again last year. I mean, the governor's proposed cuts and in, in the proposed upstreaming of revenue uh, didn't occur, and and we had PFD cuts again. We have PFD taxes again. Uh, it's not it's not like we haven't had taxes uh, the last four years. As as the governor makes these as as the governor makes these decisions not to pursue upstreaming revenue again, to to limit the amount of cuts he's going to make elsewhere in the budget, uh, we're just we're just we're accelerating the debate about what kind of taxes we're going to have. We will have taxes this coming year. There is not. It, if by taking these cuts off the table, by taking upstreaming local revenues off the table, um, we we are going to have a budget gap. There will be taxes to close, uh, to close that budget gap. It's not a question of whether there's going to be taxes. Uh, just like the last four years, it's not a question of whether there's going to be taxes. There will be taxes. It's a question of what form the taxes are going to take. Right. We've done we've done PFT taxes the last four years. Um, uh, the question is going to be, uh, do we find another more equitable approach uh, in, the, in the future? Uh, so that's number one. This actually leads us into number two, which is the departure of uh, David Teal from the legislative finance director position as he retires. Um, what does this say? Uh, you know, what does this say for Alaska? I mean, some are some are, are boohooing that it's so sad that they're losing a great man, this quiet, uh, you know, this hidden giant. Uh, you say it's uh, not necessarily uh, uh, not not necessarily that bad a thing to get him out of there. Oh, I, David Teal. Um, 
David Thiel has a lot of fans. Um, he's director of legislative finance. Uh, he speaks uh, his legislative finance's job to analyze the budget and and sort of is the keeper of the budget and keeper of keeper of fiscal policy at the at the legislative level. Uh, and David has a lot of fans. But but David, in my opinion, uh, has been part of a significant part uh, of the of the problem uh, down the legislature. Not not part of the solution. Um, in 2017, we've dis we've discussed this show before, and, and we'll discuss it again, I'm sure. But in 2017, Ledge Finance led the the reclassification of the permanent fund dividend from designated general fund to unrestricted general fund, and that that had all that had a huge impact uh, on the way people discuss the permanent fund dividend on the way the media writes about the permanent fund dividend, on the way the legislature has addressed the permanent fund dividend. It essentially said uh, the permanent fund dividend is not is not a statutory program, um, uh, and it's it's just unrestricted general funds that the legislature can use for, for whatever purpose it wants. And that was just wrong. I mean, it's wrong. The, the designated, the, the reason we have designated general funds uh, as defined by ledge finance itself is state funds that have statutory restrictions on use, that but but that can be spent for any purpose through appropriation, but but the key part of that is state funds that have statutory restriction on use. Well, the permanent fund dividend has statutory restrictions on use. It says the statutes say that it will that the 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 permanent fund corporation will will uh, contribute a portion of revenues to. Uh, to the state, uh, to the state treasury, uh, for purposes of the dividend, it defines that amount that will be uh, contributed for the permanent fund dividend, um, and and then the statutes go on and say, and this is how the straight the Department of Revenue will treat uh, the revenues that it's getting from the permanent fund corporation and how it will calculate the permanent fund dividend. Right. Everything is defined by statute, uh, and yet in in the face of that, in the face of their own classifications. Uh, David Thiel uh, and Ledge Finance uh, reclassified uh, the permanent fund dividend as unrestricted general revenue, and that's a big part of the problem that we have today. Right, which of course we've talked about here on the program before. That's when they started treating it as instead of a simple pass through or a transfer, they started treating it as income, and that's when you started seeing all the charts about how much the dividend was costing the uh, the state of Alaska. Uh, and that, of course, that framed this whole new conversation that we've been in for the last four years, essentially. It has. And 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 David, I mean, people say, well, David's nonpartisan and David's just calling balls and strikes. He's not. He he legislative finance changed, uh, 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 ignored their own classification system, ignored their own classification system to make that change and to and to set up the permanent fund dividend to be treated by the legislature um, as as unrestricted general funds, Th there's 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 more problems that I have with David than simply that. But to, but to you know write write articles and say what a great person he was and how he was just the umpire calling balls and strikes and he was nonpartisan and and all he did was was give the facts of the legislature is just wrong. Uh, David went out of his way. Ledge Finance went out of their way to reclassify to violate their own rules, their own their own standards, their own classifications. Uh, to, to treat the permanent fund uh, uh, dividend in a way that that set it up for for being taken by government and and I he I, he may deserve credit for some things but he absolutely deserves the blame uh, for 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 rolling over and doing that in 2017 he was not impartial uh, he was not nonpartisan. Uh, it was a very partisan move, partisan on behalf of the top 20 percent, partisan move to uh, to set up the dividend for uh, for being taken by the legislature. So David Teal has departed again. Not, not a big fan of David Teal, are you? And uh, we explained why. But where does this lead us? What happens next before we jump into number three here, Brad, quickly? Well, th David Teal is going to be replaced. And, and I think I think there's two things. That, that come out of uh, out of Teal's term that really uh, are important when you look forward to, to who replaces him. And this is this replacement is frankly as important, if not maybe more important, because it's longer lasting as as the decision about who's going to be the new OMB director and the decision about who's going to be uh, the new commissioner of revenue. The legislative finance division director's job 
uh, is a critical job. And I think there's I think there's two things that sort of come out of the experience with Teal that are important. One, whoever comes into that job needs to play it straight up. Teal didn't. He he twisted uh, even the ledge finances own categories to to reclassify the permanent fund dividend from. DGF from designated general funds to, to unrestricted general funds. He didn't play it straight up. We need a legislative finance director uh, to play it straight up and to say to the legislature, when you take permanent fund dividends, you're 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 re -des you're you're reclassifying funds that are statutorily designated for a certain purpose to another purpose. I mean, the legislature explodes when they do that on community revenue sharing, for example. The legislature needs to deal with the fact that that's what they're doing. Uh, when they take when they take permanent fund dividends, the second thing that Teal never did, uh, and that and that in my view a legislative finance director should do as part of his obligation to analyze the budget, is they need to look. He needs whoever comes into that role needs to look at the impact of the various proposals the legislatures the legislature is making, taking the PFD, taxing the PFD according to the ICER uh, analysis in 2016 has the largest adverse impact not only on Alaska families, uh, because it targets uh, middle and lower income Alaska families, not only has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families, it had, according to ICER, the largest adverse impact uh, on, the, uh, on the overall Alaska economy. That, those words, I don't, you know, I don't recall those words ever leaving Teal's lips. I don't recall him ever advising the legislature, right. uh, if you do this uh, through PFD cuts, you're gonna have the largest adverse impact on the, on the overall Alaska economy. Whoever comes into that role needs to talk not only about you know the the dollars and cents of these movements, uh, but needs to also talk about the impact of these movements. That's an that's something the legislature needs to needs to hear and needs to confront uh, when it makes these economic decisions. And I think that it's important for the legislative finance director to be out front talking about the impacts, the distributional impacts, and the economic impacts. Of the, of the decisions that the legislature is considering. Well, we'll see who gets picked. And like you said, this is a long-lived position. This is not an appointed position that changes with every administration. Teal was there for years. And so, uh, you know, 20 years. So it definitely has a long-lasting effect and definitely important. Let's move on to number three. Um, number three is the ConocoPhillips deciding to sell some of their Alaska investments to help uh, offset some of their future investments in the state. Uh, good or bad, Brad? What are we What are we looking at here? Quickly, we got about four minutes. I was surprised by Conoco's announcement that they're that they're uh, a public announcement. They're looking to sell 25 percent of their interests on the west side uh, of the slope. In the last couple of years, Conoco had done a lot of things to consolidate uh, its interests. It had bought uh, BP out of Kaparik, for example. BP held a 30 plus percent interest in the Kaparik River field. Conoco had bought BP out of that, uh, it, and Conoco had bought the the Nuna field uh, from I uh, uh, can't remember the name of the company, but it bought the uh, the Nuna field uh, on the west side of the of the north of the North Slope in order to consolidate its interests on the west side. There's there's a definite benefit in consolidation. I mean, it's I've, I've been in battles between owners uh, within given fields. Uh, and it sucks a lot of oxygen out of the out of the room when you've got different owners with different drivers in fields. There's a lot of benefit uh, when you have a single owner who's able to sort of make the decision to go forward. And Conoco injecting uh, another owner into the west side of the North Slope is a surprise after what it's been doing to consolidate uh, its its position over on the west side, um, and is a concern to me about what that's going to do with its ability to. Uh, to continue the development on the, on on the western side of the North Slope, given that it's going to have a partner in there who's going to have uh, somewhat different interests. I mean, it it inevitably happens somewhat different interests uh, in in how they develop and the kind of the kind of commitments that they're willing to make, the kind of financial commitments they're willing to make. Um, and and I and I it's just it's another concern. Hillcorp, uh, BP selling off uh, uh, its interests uh, to Hillcorp, and now Conoco proposing to sell a quarter of the interests. A quarter of its interest on the North Slope is a concern about what that's doing to, um, uh, what 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 that's going to do to future development on the slope. Brad Keithley, uh, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. They're still planning on spending about sixteen billion dollars in the state, but again, without that amount of control, it does kind of raise some questions.
So game this out for me, Brad. Um, you know, $16 billion is what they're still saying that they're going to spend. That's what's being reported by the Energy Desk and Nat Herz. Uh, that's what they were looking to do, and they're saying they just need some of that. They need to make some stuff liquid so that they can uh, – so that they could free some of that stuff up. But, uh, I mean, is that the full story, do you think? Or is there something else going on that that we're just not seeing in your uh, in your experience? I, I think I think uh, we're seeing Conoco hedge its bets. Um, they have uh, they have been one of the big uh, uh, boosters of Alaska development. They've been one of the big investors in Alaska development. Uh, the consolidation of Kaparik was to position themselves to, to – to not have to deal with partners uh, in Kaparik. Uh, the acquisition of Nuno was to position itself to uh, sort of be, be in control of West Side development. And I think, I think we're seeing Conoco um, hedge its bets, just like, just like BP <coughs> completely hedged its bets by, by selling off and, and essentially reinvesting uh, uh, that money in, uh, in, in uh, uh, shale development in the lower 48. We're seeing Conoco sort of do some of the same thing. Um, Conoco has interests in lower 48 shale. Uh, they are probably underweighted uh, as a company in terms of the amount of shale development they have compared to what the ideal would be. They're probably overweight. They've been overweighted in Alaska. They've, they've said that's because they view Alaska as, as a great opportunity. Um, and, and I have no doubt that, that they do and in a, in a great uh, uh, having a great potential going forward. But I think what we're seeing with this, with this proposal to sell off a quarter is sort of a sort of a repositioning of Conoco in a way of getting out of some of its Alaska risk exposure um, and, and putting that money uh, down into, down into uh, additional shale development. It, Conoco, Conoco has the capacity to raise the amount of money it takes uh, to uh, to develop the west side, they can do that either by uh, from cash flow plus borrowing or by by uh, uh, selling other assets. They could easily raise enough money to do what it takes to to develop the west side. They're choosing not to do that. They're choosing to, to sort of short on raising all that money themselves. Uh, somebody else come in to to join with. And then, and then using the, the the cash that they otherwise would have used to develop the North Slope, that that quarter interest uh, to redeploy that cash uh, elsewhere. And I, and it's just a, it has a feel to me of of hedging their bets uh, on Alaska, and that that's for a lot of reasons. I mean, uh, uh, the the environment up here, both both the physical environment as well as the financial environment as well as the governmental environment, is is challenging at times. Um, and, and there's a lot of benefit to being, um, in shale as opposed to the sort of long lead projects that you, that you have in Alaska, but it's, but it's much more, it's much more than simply, uh, getting money to, to fund their program. It's, it's Conoco hedging their bets on Alaska. And that's, and that's, that should be concerning to us, especially after the BP sale to Hillcorp, it should be, it should it should be concerning to us that that companies, major companies up here, are hedging their bets on Alaska. Well, and I think, I mean, I don't know how much of that has to do with uh, the discussion on oil taxation or anything else, or whether it's just a general market, uh, you know, again, just kind of a, a, a you know, a spreading to keep things uh, to keep things right. But uh, definitely, uh, even Harold said in the chat room that you know Conoco's leadership team is pretty much cutting edge. You should be paying attention to what's going on. Uh, you know, with what they do, and uh, it does uh, raise a few concerns for sure. And uh, and hopefully, hopefully, we'll be we'll be watching this to see what happens with this. Final thoughts here, Brad. Um, as you uh, as we go on, uh, any thoughts on where you think this budget is going to land when the governor drops it here in less than what are we twenty days away now? Well, I, the governor is going to do what he's going to do. If if I were the governor at this point, what I would do is come out with an alternate budget and say. Here, here's here's what we need to cut. Uh, here's here's the budget gap. Here's one budget that does it by cutting. Uh, you may you may or may not like that. Here's another budget that does it by raising revenue equitably. Um, and let's have a debate about which road we're going we're going down. I would put both of those out there uh, so that people truly understand 
that that we're going to have to pay for if we want more services we're going to have to pay for more services and let's have a debate about how we're going to pay for it that's that's in an equitable way i'm not sure i don't i don't know what the governor's going to do but that's the way i would approach it but but we're definitely at the end of the day we're going to have a budget gap even his proposal even his budget proposal is going to have a budget gap and we need to be all of us need to be thinking about what our thoughts are about how how that gap gets closed what's the equitable way to close that gap we appreciate you coming on board my friend and i look forward to uh, look forward to talking to you again next week michael as always thanks for having me appreciate appreciate you coming on board well that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from alaskans for sustainable budgets thank you again for joining us remember that you can find past episodes on our youtube and soundcloud pages and keep track of us during the week on facebook and twitter This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.